I have a video coming out eventually about creating character backstories and maybe even character applications, and I've been looking through a bunch of them. This is probably something that you don't want to do, though. Character concept slash brief backstory. He's a human dampier paladin of the divine sauce. His dwarven short stack waifu, whom he affectionately calls Owanahol, asked him nicely, very nicely. So with no greater idea of what's going on, he threw Owana hole over his shoulder like a sack of flour, which obviously she was more than happy with, and began the journey to the mountain. I like gag characters. They fill me with happiness at the situation they find themselves in. If this one is too unique, I have plenty of others I can submit that are less unique. I mean, if he was trying to make a gag character, he succeeded. He'll make the DM gag in disgust, so I guess points for that, but uh, good luck finding any actual games. New Guy joins a Call of Cthulhu game midway. It takes place in America in 1930s. First session, he spends two hours to choose a character. A Yakuza boss, a science experiment, a Tibetan monk, a renegade samurai, all anime characters. We lightly push until he's settled into a military tech with PTSD, a murdered family, and a trained dog. Alright, so first session he played, evil bad guy says, Whatever you do, don't push this button or I will die. Whole party just goes, seriously, reverse psychology, it's clearly a trap. New guy just goes in with, I'm touching it. Dude, no. Well, he does, and guess what? It was a trap. All good NPCs die, and all the enemies go aggro. Our game master bends reality and saves the players, but the mission fails. Words start flying. We meet over coffee to show him we weren't angry for real. He gets creepy and says, I'm a nice guy, but girls only go out with bad boys. He then tries to hit on my girlfriend. Oh, we're both girls and lesbian. I joke that, dude, she's not interested. We have a no dick rule. He says his dick is small and she'll not even notice. Dude, what? We poker face before laughing about it. Second session comes around, last session. He has to reroll his stats, claiming he didn't know enough about the game before. The game master is fine with it. Two hours later, he has a character that has 99% in shooting, 99% in persuasion, 99% in animal training. That's it. Fine. He spends, honest to god, two hours on his own, haggling over fake money with random people. When he meets the other player characters, he decides to talk to us like a Skyrim NPC. Then decides he wants to be an expert on Cthulhu? Final piece of cake is when he fails the sanity check and finds himself walking around with his gun. The game master says, You wake up. You are in an alley. You have your gun. A homeless man is begging you not to hurt him. The guy shrugs. I kill him. The police arrive. I kill them. The game master tries to give him a way out. There's a gate behind you. Can I aim at their head since they're driving a police car? The policeman just kill his character. Why are you punishing me over a homeless man? <sighs> Dude, nice guys. They suck. I don't know what else to say here. Not only is he a nice guy though, but he's also a murder hobo, which we haven't talked about in a long time, which is interesting because it's one of the first subjects on this channel that actually got popular. But yeah, murder hobos, they're, well, they're not great. The main reason is because the DM is trying to tell a story, and a murder hobo can absolutely derail and destroy that story. Now, I always encourage player choice, but there's a social contract between DMs and players. Like, players will go along with the adventure that the DM is prepping. If you're playing Curse of Strahd, the players probably shouldn't refuse to go into Barovia. In order for the adventure to happen, you need to go into Barovia. A murder hobo is breaking that social contract, and not only does that ruin the fun for the DM, that also ruins the fun for the players, because they need to play the DM's adventure. Choice is one thing. Choices that ruin the fun of the group, that's another thing. Also, gross jokes about dick size and homeless people. Not appreciated. Pretty much ever, I think. I really enjoy a good horror story, so I think it's about time I add my own to this sub. First, a little background. I used to frequent a local game store because of my partaking of the cardboard crack that is trading card games. At the time of the story, I was already playing and running games in 5th edition for some friends, and the local game store had its own West Marches game on Monday nights. A few of my local game store mates started looking around for home games, 
Enter Jay. Jay had never really played much Dungeons and Dragons before, but really loved the idea of it. He particularly loved the idea of the Dungeon Master. He had gotten himself a DM guide, and he was really into the idea of running games. He had his own setting all thought up, and a few players of varying experiences were interested. One of them said it was really fun and that I should come along. Story, banter, and challenge. Sounded good. I came out of curiosity and because it was the chance to be a player for a change. Players are as follows. Princess, a homebrew witch class. Character was a princess in lore setting. Lunk, a barbarian slash ranger. Think Link from The Legend of Zelda, but really angry. Spark, an arcane trickster rogue. Loki vibes. K, a half-elven druid. Loved Critical Role. Edgy, an assassin rogue. Had never played D&D before, but liked the Elder Scrolls. Strike one, the first session. DMJ tells us that the adventure is set in his own world. There are two great kingdoms that are at war, and we are adventurers caught in the middle. Only one side of the conflict uses magic, and the setting is very low magic and feudal. We may have to take a side eventually, but there apparently will be political intrigue as well as swords and sorcery. He also says to us that it's going to be challenging and difficult in both combat and roleplay. Sounds like my cup of tea. So I rolled up a wizard to level 2, a high elf illusionist. I had the idea of playing him as a bit of a self-serving asshole, like Edwin of Thay from Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. I was determined to do the whole evil character in a neutral to good party thing. Thought it'd be cool story-wise, and Jay seemed on board, wrote up a backstory and such. The party find me locked in a cell in the dungeon, and the party and I get through the first few sessions until we get to the boss, an orc warchief. As I said, I'm usually a DM, and I know that the challenge rating of one of these guys is about 4, but it's cool, Jay knows we're level 2, and wouldn't be running the creature fully as written, right? Wrong. I cast Magic Missile on it, and it immediately charges towards me. First attack, it gets through my shield spell, but damage-wise, it's a low roll. It gets me down to 1 hit point, though. Second attack is a 19 on the die, which I'm informed is a crit. And because I'm at such low health, once damage is counted, it kills me instantly. No unconsciousness or death saves, I'm just dead because it dealt over double my max hit points, so I have to sit there for the rest of the session. Kay and Spark are experienced players as well and are looking at me like I've been cheated. So not only did he run a creature with minions that was way beyond the party's capabilities, but he also made it stronger by giving it three fighter levels. So it's, uh, it's that kind of game, huh? Jay approaches me after and says he's sorry that it worked out that way, but he hopes I'll roll up something else and come back next week. He's going to speed level the party to improve balance. He clearly had no idea what he was doing, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I leave it be for a few sessions, but this time I roll Ragnak, a half-orc vengeance paladin. I make him huge, dumb, and completely lovable to the rest of the party. I get him 20 strength, a glaive, the polearm master, and sentinel feats, and proceed to destroy a boss that he puts in front of the party as a trial by combat thing. He sets it up as a pit fighting kind of rule set, where my opponent and I roll initiative every round. But, thanks to Polemaster slash Sentinel, I'm getting three attacks to his two attacks, and that's when he actually even gets to melee me in the first place. On top of this, Spark and Princess are aiding me by quietly spellcasting from their stands. Jay looks like he'd love nothing more than to kill my character, but because of the way I made him and made the party love him, he knows the table would be an open revolt if he did. In the sessions that follow, we get nowhere near the two warring kingdoms we were told about. We are seemingly out in the frontier lands and all that political intrigue? Yeah, that's going on somewhere else while we drag ourselves through mountains and fight Etons, unable to keep track of our movements or make a map because Jay hasn't made a map yet. I start to get a lurch in my stomach. The game shambles on until Strike 2, the spooky one-shot. So Halloween is coming up, and Jay wants to do a special one-off session that'll not be connected to the main story. He wants to branch out and use some survival horror themes. I bring Ragnak, my paladin, along. When the session starts, we are told that we are locked in a wooden cage with none of our items. Everything's gone. We make investigation checks to find something to jimmy the lock with. Nothing. Princess starts to cast a spell to damage the cage. Nothing. I attempt to brawn my way through the wooden bars. Also nothing. Jay says that after we try all these things, assumingly pointlessly, the door on the cage just swings open. 
We then make our way down the corridors, still no items. We trigger some traps, which we have no idea are there and that we can't disarm because the rogues have no thieves tools. We are then informed that there is a death knight chasing us and we do not have time to be searching every room, so we move on. Because at our current level, the death knight could TP chaos within like two rounds. K and Spark and I are experienced players, we know this. The dungeon is a series of branching corridors with sections that close behind us so we can't backtrack. Somehow, this does not impede the Death Knight, who is always one or two rooms behind us, and Jay takes great pains to just remind us constantly of this. Edgy falls down a pitfall trap and is just out of the game for a while as he falls to a lower section of the dungeon. We can't follow down the pit because we have no rope, and as soon as we start thinking about doing something else, we are told that the door to this section starts rattling, so we have to move on and leave him. People are visibly and audibly frustrated, and the session kind of pitters out. Nobody is enjoying themselves. Jay is frustrated because we didn't reach the end of the one shot he made, and the players are hating it because we literally cannot do anything. There were perhaps half a dozen rolls between all of us the entire game. I say afterwards to the two other experienced players that I'm done, and they say to think about it and come back because they like my character. I have a chat with DMJ about what railroading means, that he seems to like it. Nonetheless, I have a couple weeks off and contemplate whether I'm going to bother continuing. Fast forward a few weeks and a couple of the other players are messaging me saying that it's gotten good and that we are about to enter a cavern with a powerful magical item inside. As stated, the campaign has been really low magic up until this point. When I come back, though, I am met with Strike 3, The Wall. So I am persuaded to come back for a session to give this one one more chance. And true enough, Jay has had a large enemy settlement all mocked up. He's clearly been doing some reading because he's got some environmental effects and three-dimensional battlefields going on here. We pass through the enemy camp and into the cavern, navigating our way through slowly and carefully to dodge traps and find loot. And we were told that there is an exit to the outside bordering the sea. A wall-like sea cliff rises above us. There is an opening near the top, and it becomes obvious that we are meant to climb it. Ragnax, time to shine, I think to myself. Ragnak will take some rope and climb, and the others can climb behind once he gets to the top. I say in character, I was doing the whole third person thing, I said to Jay that I want to use my superior strength to climb up, run the rope to the top so the rest of the party can climb up easier. He frowns, suddenly annoyed. Sure, make an athletics check. So Ragnak does. He makes it, and he passes. So I start saying that when I get to the top, I'm going to wrap it around my waist and grip the rock so the party can- You've only climbed 15 feet. Roll athletics again. He made me roll athletics every 15 feet while the rest of the table just watched. If I fail any checks, I failed only two, I would have to make a dexterity saving throw where if I failed, I would take damage from falling rocks or slide down the cliff face. Ragnak's climb went on for 20 minutes in real life, and the party and I were just bored as hell. When I finally get Ragnak to the top, everyone else managed to climb up fine because the experienced players and I successfully argued that because Ragnak was at the top holding the rope, he was technically assisting the other climbers, giving them advantage. Jay wanted them all struggling up the cliff, like I did. After we get to the top, the session ended. Everyone was pissed, including DMJ, who had wanted the cliff climb to be this dangerous, death-defying obstacle for the whole group, and my actions had ruined that? So he wanted at least one character to feel the difficulty he intended. I told him later in private that I wasn't prepared to be in a game where the DM punishes players for solving problems. I'm not here as a player to thwart the DM, but the DM should not be there just to kill players. Never came back, but I did hear later that the game fell apart because players started leaving after I did. The last straw was apparently when he openly used homophobic slurs towards Princess's player, who was male and gay, and Jay had a meltdown because nobody cared about his campaign world, which we had never seen or experienced any world building for at all. In short, remember that no D&D is better than bad D&D, and that guy DMs are so much worse than that guy players. If you're in a game with a DM like Jay, remember that you owe it to your own enjoyment of this hobby to find a better table. 
couldn't have said it better myself. Yes, I understand DMs wanting to run a more difficult campaign. Now, first note, in session zero, when you say, I want to run a difficult campaign, please establish how difficult, like what are we talking about here? Are we talking difficult for experienced players? Difficult for new players? Should I try to min-max and optimize? Is that not necessary? Like what builds is this going to be difficult for? Et cetera, et cetera. There are so many layers within difficult in Dungeons and Dragons. Difficult, as a word, doesn't really sum up everything, so go a little bit more in depth. Of course, the DM, like the OP said, not the enemy of the players. Even if you are playing in a game that's a bit more hardcore, you shouldn't be out to destroy your players. You should be there to present a challenge, but when they overcome it, don't get salty. I mean, that's what they were supposed to do especially with good problem solving. That's part of D&D, an integral part of the game. You should provide challenge, but if your players solve and overcome that challenge, then that's just part of the game. I'm still so annoyed by this. Okay, so background. I've played a few games with this guy before, but not an actual campaign, and he wasn't that problematic at first. Some red flags that I didn't notice until later. Like he wanted us to critique our own roleplay and wanted a huge breakdown review of his session. It was such a pain because he always complained about how bad the session was for him and that how he could do better, which would cause the group to grovel at his feet for an hour or so saying how cool or awesome he was every time. When this guy, let's call him Rob, told the group we were going to be doing Curse of Strahd, I was legitimately excited. Curse of Strahd is one of my favorite modules. I love horror and gothic horror, so I didn't really care about the red flags I mentioned earlier because he promised we'd all get a chance to DM and kind of pass it around as a group experience since people wanted to try their hand at DMing. This whole thing stopped when it got to Rob's turn to DM. We got to Death House incredibly early because the guy DMing, Kurt at the time, wanted us to get invested. Rob made him stop the session because he nearly got our characters killed, so we had a week-long cliffhanger, and that's when I noticed it. See, Rob's character, Connor, was a nobleman barbarian. We played on roll 20, so you could see this whenever he rolled for attacks or whatever. Except at some point, Rob had changed Connor to be a sorcerer paladin warlock. A sorcerer illidan lock, if you will. No real explanation. No in-game explanation either. Not even a heads up. He just shoots magic now and zips around constantly. He even suspiciously looks like DM even more now. And then the whole mood of the campaign changes. We went from dark, oppressive, gothic horror to Marvel's Avengers. I kid you not. He constantly tried to be the Iron Man of the group, cracking quips, trying to be cool, and generally obnoxious. He then starts telling our characters that he's actually Sergi, Strahd's brother, reincarnated, and that's why he has magical powers now. My husband and I look at each other and mute the call when this happens because we can't help but laugh. The whole campaign just goes downhill from there. Rob tries to make his character Connor the center of attention in everything. Then he chucks out the Strahd module and just says he's going to improve it. He disregards the module and makes up his own lore and canon without telling anybody ahead of time, getting angry at anyone who says something that doesn't line up with his notes. Like someone saying something about orc tribes only for him to snap that orcs don't exist? Actually, calling it his own lore slash canon would be a lie. He stole it from a bunch of other fantasy series. It's one thing to be inspired by different stories, but another is just ripping off characters, plot ideas, and world building one to one from those sources. Hell, I could tell he heavily stole from Witcher and Dragon Age because he didn't bother renaming NPCs he took from there. It all comes to a head when we are fighting Strahd. Rob literally has our characters stand there and watch as his character Connor has this overdramatic, long-winded speech to Strahd, going on and on about how sad he is that Strahd is evil, and then they fight. No one else gets to fight Strahd. It's Rob's moment. He verbatim says, it's my moment. This would happen anytime someone tries to help his character, a character that just so happened to always get nat 20s on all his rolls. The thing that annoyed me the most about this was the fact that this group actually cheered him on. My husband and I didn't know these people, so we thought they were tired of his garbage too, but nope. Rob somehow 
Got them wrapped around his finger so bad, they pretty much simped for his DMing. My husband and I left pretty much right after that. We couldn't handle such a narcissistic DM with a god complex for so much longer. In truth, we only stuck around because we liked the dynamic of our two characters. After we left, we took our characters and actually had fun with a new group we found. But then we found out later that Rob used my husband's character as a villain in a sequel campaign just to get back at him. I am so glad we got out of there. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I uh, have to agree with you on that. What is up with Cursor Strahd? I did a poll the day of recording this, and it seems people really want my opinion on why there are so many Cursor Strahd horror stories and maybe even how to prevent it. So that's going to be a whole video coming out this Wednesday, so I won't talk about it here, but I am going to talk about Rob's interesting style of DMing. Now, I do not like alternating DMs in a campaign. It's a lot to handle. If you want a clean, tonally consistent campaign with smooth world building and such, you might not get that if everyone is DMing. It's just, it's not easy to pull off. Can you pull it off? Yes, you can, absolutely. I haven't seen it happen, but I'm sure it can be done. Is it easy? No, which is why not many people do it. Rob clearly wanted a different tone for the campaign, a more MCU-style action-adventure. That's fine, that's a perfectly valid way to write in your game, and a perfectly valid tone to go for, but the rest of the group wasn't down for it, which is where the horror story lies. On top of that, I will also say that DMPCs, again, like I've said multiple times, they're bad. They take away the spotlight from the players if you do them wrong. You can do them right, I did a whole video about doing them right, but here, clearly, his character Connor being the brother of Strahd is just comedy gold that cannot be ignored. Early on in my online D&D career, I had this experience. It involves a real weirdo of a guy who I will call Spencer. Also involved in the story is a player in a short lived game run by Spencer who then started to run his own game with Spencer as a player that was also quite short lived who I will name Tori. This starts out with a few of us joining off a Roll20 game that was pretty normal initially. I can't even remember the plot or anything, but it was just a classic fantasy world. First two red flags when we joined Spencer's Discord was a dedicated Discord channel of homebrew mechanics, all of which detailed his homebrew mechanics of what happens if you lose in a fight. Basically boiled down to the enemies get to decide what to do with you. Kidnap, murder, blah, blah, blah. But if you were playing a woman, there was a high likelihood that you would be, um, ard. We were like, okay, weird. But we were early in our D&D career, so we were like, oh, this is probably fine. At least we get to play D&D. Second red flag came shortly after where he was talking about the available races and some of the homebrew races he had in this world and started posting examples of what they look like in his world and all these examples, well they were all furry porn. Now I don't have anything expressly against furries but this coupled with the above mentioned red flag was enough to make myself and Tori go, um, this campaign died after like two sessions, and Tori was like, hey, I want to try my hand at running my own game, and invited everyone from this short-lived campaign, including Spencer. You know, the guy running the Discord server. That was a big mistake. It started cold open with Spencer creating a Kitsune girl archaeologist type who was also apparently an outlander and lived outside of civilized society and doesn't understand civilized customs. This doesn't understand civilized customs manifested as his character actively refusing to wear clothing in most situations. So this guy is playing this attractive Kitsune girl that was just walking around stark naked. When we would go to sleep, he would always make sure that we knew that he would find a high place to sleep completely naked under the moonlight to charge my power. <sighs> Ooh, weirdo. This culminated into a situation where we were investigating an imposter who was ruining the profits of the large guilds in the town and making large orders to the guilds, which caused the guilds to be stuck with the bills for orders they didn't make. We tracked this imposter to a local bardello and found that she was the mistress of this location. Turns out this mistress was a changeling and ended up escaping from us. 
We then were asked to brief the leader of the city guard in what was happening and when we went to the city hall where her office was, she refused to sit down with us until Spencer's character got dressed as we were in the official city hall and there is decorum that must be followed. Plus, it's just weird to be walking around town completely naked. Spencer proceeds to throw a huge fit, accusing the DM, Tori, of being a bad DM and ruining the fun of the game. Spencer then proceeds to pout for the rest of the session and afterwards announces he's leaving the game because he, quote, can't in good consciousness play in the game with such a dominating DM who is dedicated to ruining the fun and controlling his players. Oh, and also, I completely forgot this part just shows more of how sus this dude is. Apparently, one of the other players contacted me after this garbage and told me that Spencer was running a new game riddled with microtransactions. Like, straight up, pay me 20 bucks to start with a legendary sword kind of garbage. So yeah, this dude was more sus in more ways than one. Okay, that was bad. I'm curious how Spencer's initial campaign just fell apart, but I imagine it was through similar antics. Yeah, guys, this is going a little bit past fun. This is going into straight up creepy territory. Now, if for some ungodly reason your entire group, every single person is 100% down for all this, you know, you can do what you want in the comfort and privacy of your own D&D game, but Spencer is inflicting this upon the rest of the players, which is never okay. And also, I do not know why the players put up with this for so long. We should normalize talking to players and, if needed, letting them go if they refuse to change and improve. That is something that you may need to do if you have a player who is this bad. Also, microtransactions, not good either. If you guys enjoyed this episode of RPG Horror Stories and want to let me know, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then please do subscribe to Crispy's Tavern. I have plenty more RPG Horror Stories, over a hundred of them, and I also do D&D advice if you want to check that out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment CLOTHES with an exclamation point and question mark to let me know you made it to the end of the video. And as a like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.